multimillionaires and the insurance companies and the billionaires. It's just like a pattern. The other day I heard him on TV saying that, I heard him on the radio on, on the issue of health care. It was a first NPR program about deductibles. He said, oh, deductibles are great. You, know, you have them in auto insurance, you have them here. It's, it's important to have, have deductibles. You know, comparing, comparing a fender bender to whether or not your kid, you know, gets, gets proper care. So it's a very consistent pattern and it does apply to this area of, of the internet as well as to the water issues and others. I mean, the difference between us is just dramatic. But I do believe that, that, oh, I absolutely believe that there are many members of the Senate on these issues who would come together. Look, the, people forget that certain issues were not particularly partisan before the Tea Party. It's only been five and a half years. Comprehensive immigration reform. President Bush, climate change, Nancy Pelosi sitting on a bench there or couch with, with uh, Gingrich, um, even health care itself was not of this nature. These are campaign not, finance reform. Well, yeah, there, there was a bill that had something to do with it. Um, John, you, thank you for prompting that. Um, these, these things are simply not inherently partisan issues, and they don't need to be, and I, I feel like I know how to help make them less partisan. You know, the last, the last six years in Wisconsin in particular, um, the, there's been this tremendous conversation about whether government can be effective in getting it, things like infrastructure or broadband or water or, any, or anything really. I mean, that's sort of been the brand that has um, really been prominent in the state over the last few years. Did you see, did you, in your, in your visit to all the counties last year and this year, do you run into much of the attitude that, well, those would be nice, but we don't know that government can, you as a representative of government can get that done? How prominent do you think that is? I think on these issues, there? there's a strong feeling that government has to be a partner. Okay. I mean, people know, you know, business people know that they're not going to pay for the new road right. in, in Janesville and Beloit. You know, they can't do that. They know that there has to be some federal and state funding. And I think they know when it comes to the internet. If we just if we just leave it up to the corporate interest, they know it's they're they're not they're never gonna get it. It's gonna be forever before they extend it. That's a whole sort of thing behind the real rural electrification and others. Mm -hmm. So I mean that's one where government simply says there can't be a monopoly. It's not government sort of taking it over. So um, yeah, I think I think people realize there has to be some kind of partnership. They don't want the heavy hand of the federal government. Great example recently on climate change shows this was from the Obama administration. You know, there was no legislation or anything. They just got to talking to the heavy truck industry. And the heavy truck industry said, you know what? We need to, we want to get away from this. So they cut a deal. It's a huge thing. It's, they, they constitute 25% of the auto emissions. They've agreed voluntarily to a significant change in their uh, approach going forward without any of this partisan stuff going back and forth. They just did it. So, you know, I think people realize that there has to be some kind of guidance, at least a goal from the federal government, and then try to engage partners in doing it. So, no, I, th I think a lot of this was generated by uh, an attempt to prevent the Obama administration from ever getting off the ground. Mm -hmm. And when you get to the actual issues themselves, I mean, certain issues are very are going to be partisan almost forever, like taxes, the level of taxes. I mean, that's mm -hmm. Obviously, is just one of those things that's sort of ingrained. But so many of these things really should have nothing to do with partisan politics, and people would be so much happier if, if they were approached in a different way. Do you think if Hillary is elected, that same kind of approach by the by Congress will will be the case? I mean, she's not any, any more well liked than Obama. Well, I wouldn't put it in terms of popularity. I would put it in terms of pragmatism. She is very pragmatic. Mm -hmm. I saw her come to the Senate. I was there. She immediately forged some kind of a relationship with every Republican and did something with them. She is very practical. Sometimes I find it to be uh, something I don't want. Because, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the, I, don't, I, don't, I don't like everything that she would necessarily want to do. do but. I think we're about to have a, a president who actually sincerely wants to deal with some of these issues, issues she's followed all her life. I think we're going to have a Democratic Senate, but not by a lot. And we're going to have a House of Representatives with less of the Tea Party people, with a speaker who um, 
even though I couldn't disagree with him more, uh, is not somebody who is uh, on all the issues an extremist. I think his economic policies are, are extremist. But his overall demeanor is a person who probably would not want to be blamed for stopping anything from happening. So I actually believe that we're about to enter a, a very positive, pragmatic period. I feel very strongly, and I believe that Hillary Clinton and Tim Kaine will do this, that the first priority has to be the economic situation of middle income and working families. That has to be first. But I really believe that she will, uh, she will drive so many of these issues to a place that is less partisan. And the question is, are they going to... Are they going to let her have a, an, a fair shot at that, which they never gave Barack Obama? Uh, that's, the, that's the question. Uh, that's a very important question for the future of this country. She needs to be given an opportunity to govern. But don't you think the election results will in some way influence that? Sure. If she wins by a substantial margin sure, of course. and Democrats do particularly yep. well, that sends a signal. No, a mandate. Uh, a close election is not a good thing, though. Like, well, it's better than nothing, but, <laughs> but it, it, you're sure that would happen. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, he's got to go to Hamilton. Enjoy. Yeah, thanks. Go Cubs. Yes. <laughs> now, let me add, let me ask you one other thing. And um, we've gotten remarkably far, probably the farthest in any political conversation this year, without just mentioning Donald Trump. Uh, you mentioned him. I did, but you didn't uh, much. Anyways, <laughs> let me ask. Let me ask you. You were particular. Your Senate career was particularly identified with the issue of civil liberties. And a view of the Constitution, which often put you in alliance with some very conservative Republicans. What do you think about Donald Trump's attitude toward the Constitution, toward Bill of Rights? And it seems, it, you tell me if I'm wrong, because you were the chair of the Constitution Subcommittee. It seems to me that this guy's attitude toward the Constitution is quite amazing. It's completely disqualifying. Some, plain and simple. Anybody that has that kind of view about being able to prohibit Muslims from entering the country, I mean, he, do, he doesn't care, he doesn't have the attention span to understand the Constitution, he's never bothered to. Uh, you know, it's like a kid around that our great rabbi here, when I was growing up as a kid, Rabbi Swarzynski, whenever he gave his big sermon on Yom Kippur, would always say to the congregation his heavy German accent, the Ten Commandments are not the Ten Suggestions. <laughs> well, the same thing goes for the Bill of Rights. I mean, uh, Trump's attitude is if there's something in there that gets in his way, it's just, it doesn't count, because Donald uh, wants to, to do this stuff. And it's just, it's outrageous. And it's terrible that people in this country have been put into this place of fear that a president would be elected who would take that attitude. Uh, we, You know, when I had a chance to work uh, a special envoy that you, know, you really feel the idea of what the American ideals mean to people in places like Africa. They actually have a lot of meaning and aspiration that certainly they don't necessarily feel we always live up to it, but the goals and the notion of the Constitution are important to people around the world. If we elect somebody who has this attitude, it will so damage our, our ability to influence the rest of the world, not to mention uh, damage to our own country. And do you think if he was president, he would be a genuine threat to civil liberties? I think he could be on any given day of the week, yes. <coughs> and you would never know, even if he didn't do something, if he wouldn't do it the next day. And they would multiply that by ten times, and that's how the rest of the world would feel. It would be one of the most destabilizing things that's ever happened, in my view, in terms of the world. If, they, if the United States cannot, if they cannot look to the leader of the United States, and have any sense of where he's going, what he's going to do, if he's going to stick to it. It is destabilizing for places like China, it's destabilizing for the EU, it's destabilizing for India, it, it's de obviously destabilizing for, 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 for the Middle East. Uh, this, this would be, uh, I mean, people just would not, the, the world leaders would be so concerned and I think would have a, de a devastating economic effect as well because obviously the markets react to that sort of thing. What does it say that the, at least up until the last debate, that, that things seem to be as close as the race seem to be closing up some? Um, is that it? 
What does that say about the country? That, well, we, the, country can... the country is definitely pretty closely divided. Uh, th this is a, a different kind of divide. Uh, this is one where, you know, frankly, a number of uh, people uh, uh, who are maybe maybe conservative, but maybe just people who are feeling ripped off mm -hmm. by these trade agreements and others. He's spoken about that. In a, in, a, in a direct way that appeals to people, which I, I, I find to be actually uh, something that, of course, I happen to agree with. I violently disagree with many of his other things, but, you know, at least there's a... Bernie was doing it, too. There were candidates who were sort of passionately talking about uh, our jobs having been sold down the river. So that that's a factor. Mm -hmm. uh, not to mention just the fact that these elections are pretty close, you know. President Obama in 2012, he didn't win by that many percentage points. So three or four, you know, so you, you throw in this this kind of an environment and, uh, you know, we'll see what happens. But uh, I don't think you're going to have sort of blow up presidential elections for, for a very, very long time, maybe never. Caitlin? Well, I had a question that...